Welcome everybody to the first CPS event of the year. Um, it's lovely to see you all again. I hope you had a lovely summer. Um, before we give in, I'd love to introduce our new committee this year. So, our, and if you if you guys want to wave, <laughs> uh, our president is Cresho and our vice president is Callie. And they're going to be introducing some of the talks. You'll see them. We've got, I'm, me and Tina are co-secretaries and we do the invitations and some of the admin. Um, vice secretaries this year are Hannah and Deepali, and they do weekly emails and they help us with all sorts. The treasurer is Christoph and the vice treasurer is Lorena. Our events manager is Blake, so he's doing any, any in person, any games night, stuff like that. And helping him is Luca. And then for social media, we've got Sophia and Lauren. And catering is Jacob, so that's for our picnic tomorrow. <laughs> which I'm very hyped about. Tonight we have a very exciting speaker from St Andrews. Um, Dr Chris Knight is a research fellow at the Sea Mammal Research Unit of the Scottish Oceans Institute. He's primarily interested in the comparative physiology of diving mammals and, and peoples. His research focuses on the application of biomedical technologies and integration with existing animal-born instrumentation to develop eco-physiological research in pure and applied contexts. He also looks at the diving behavior of and energetics of seals, so I'll pass on to him. Thank you. I'm just go. Can you see the, the screen okay, the talk? Yeah. Let's check. Can you see the mouse as well? Okay, great. Well, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to talk. It's always an absolute pleasure to be invited to talk, but um, particularly nice when it's from the Chemistry Society, I have to say but also really quite nerve wracking to come from a, a biology background to then talk to, to chemists. So um, as a biologist, but particularly ecologist, we kind of do get a bit of a, not a bad rep, but a sort of particular rep because this is sort of how people see us is kind of hanging out with nice animals, sort of, you know, putting your finger in their mouth or giving them a scratch, but, I'm a marine biologist and it's sort of a bit different than sort of zoology um, and this sort of isn't really the case. Marine biology, it's actually much better. You get to hang out with the even better animals and you get to hang out by the water and you do get to spend time around these fantastic animals, learning about them and getting up close and is in the bottom right there, getting very close and occasionally getting bitten is a part of the job description. As this photo of my friend Joe Kershaw after getting bitten by a seal on the Isle of Sky a few years ago, um, looking quite jubilant after it before she got the alcohol sprayed in the wipe, and then proceeded to scream and wake right out there to the background. The coolants wake everybody up over there. So we sort of do have this a little bit of I guess within science and maybe other places of biology this kind of idea that you know we kind of yeah we're not sort of maybe the most sort of hardcore lab based, you know, um, large technology, sort of large grants, but the sort of days of, you know, the zoologist and the marine biologist that have relying upon their sort of notepad and binoculars or their scuba gear has kind of passed. And um, sort of mainly a result of the, just the logistical challenges of trying to investigate what are sort of in cases large free ranging animals that are either nocturnal or diurnal or at sea that dive or you know travel thousands upon thousands of miles has really driven um, ecology and ecophysiology towards being very open and uh, adaptive with existing technologies. So as a sort of, these were just some of the sort of technologies that I picked out from some of the abstracts for the upcoming um, biologging, animal biologging conference in a couple of weeks, you know. So a number of these technologies, you know, EKG, EEG, MEG, um, GPS, you know, these are all um, technologies that we put regularly put on animals. Then we use things like the Argos satellite system to transmit data from the poles. We also use the GSM phone network to transmit data. We put sonar on animals to create sort of a, a bit of a 3D sort of um, representation of the landscape or the species around them. Um, we also use ultrasound and Doppler to measure what's going on in terms of blood flow. Of course, we use video cameras, there's nice critter cam footage, radiometry for um, uh, three-dimensional sort of temperature measurements and respiratory bands and dwelling electrodes. 
Um, there's been a big rise in the use of drones, you know, especially in, in measuring things like body condition and animals like whales and even flying drones over whales to collect the sort of expiration. Basically, they call it like the snot bot, where they sort of catch in a little petri dish the expiration. Um, for different analysis, um, geolocators, pressure sensors. Basically, we use a whole range of technology. And as such, the sort of field of um, ecology and ecophysiology has, has moved considerably in the last really 50 years, but enormously so really in the last 10 to 15 years. But the sort of why we have access to lots of technologies, once you kind of, you know, take it to an animal that, you know, here's some examples here of some telemetry data, sort of remote transmission data from animals, is that you have animals here on the left. These are some seals from around the UK, gray seal and harbor seals, and each of those track, different colored track is an individual. And then on the right, that's some data from an Arctic turn. So these are animals that nest, you know, in the UK and then travel from the UK down to Antarctica and back again. Um, once you start to look at animals that travel that kind of distance, um, and you think something like an Arctic turn that's, you know, a few hundred grams, and then something like a seal that then dives incredibly deep, your technological limitations are pretty, you know, pretty in your face. You know, if we think about sort of the animals that I'm interested in, the marine mammals, the air breathing mammals, you have to have obviously instruments that are wearable. They also have to be pressure proof. They have to be animal proof because animals aren't very often delicate with tools that are on them. They also have to either be, you know, very power conservative or very, um, power conservative or else you know learn work for very very high resolution for a small period of time you do the recover them or transmit data so we work in this very logistically sort of challenging environment where we want to apply technology but it's quite difficult but uh, so these are air breathing mammals so our diving animals so these are the, the animals i'm going to focus on the animals that i am interested in everything from humans to you know penguins polar bears this little guy in the bottom left is a desmond a little diving mole, our leatherback turtles, and of course our big cetaceans like the humpback whale. But my real focus of interest are these guys. These are the seals. Um, we have two species in the UK, harbour and grey seals. And to me, these animals are just the most interesting animals in the world. I am absolutely obsessed with them. And as I'd sort of, sort of introduced in a minute or two, they're actually of you know, broad interest to us as humans, both for understanding their physiology, but they're also very important in terms of the data that they can provide us with. So just to work out what a seal is, um, when people think of a seal, they kind of think of these three sort of animals here, plus walrus, and we've actually had a walrus visiting the UK. I don't know if any of you have seen it over the last number of months, Wally, who thinks gone back up towards Iceland. So we've got three, well, four pinnipeds, the walrus, and we have the seal, this nice ribbon seal here on the ice up in the Pacific Arctic. And then we've got fur seals and we've got sea lions. But it's this group here, the seal, that I'm most interested in. Um, they're sort of evolutionary distinct from the fur seal and the sea lion that sort of have an evolutionary sort of um, ancestor similar to a bear, whereas the seal comes off something more like an otter. And as a result, their sort of anatomy, morphology, and physiology, behavior, ecology are all very, very different. So in terms of what makes seals interesting, but this sort of broader group of animals is just, it's really simple. It's this common problem that there's a disconnection between where they can breathe, this sort of very fundamental life resource. And the other fundamental life resource is where they can get food. And as such, they're sort of evolutionary pathway has um, driven them to be, you know, physiologically incredibly unique, but the sort of problems that they face when they dive, you know, the cold disconnection from oxygen, dealing with pressure are actually quite interesting for, for humans in terms of how we understand how to deal with certain physiological assault in terms of biomedical applications. Um, but also this nature of going up and down in the water column provides sort of other interesting avenues of research. So this, this is to me the king of the seals, a sort of massive up to sort of four, um, 4,000 kilo beast. It's called the elephant seal that you've probably seen in a lot of David Attenborough documentaries. We see the two big beach masters fighting on the, uh, on the beach. 
But these animals, they're sort of the extreme. If we're looking at this life where you would breathe somewhere and you've got to die somewhere else and you've got to travel really far to get to the food um, and then have to come all the way back to land to, to be able to sort of have your pup. These guys are really almost at the top of the list. So these guys can regularly, and I mean regularly, dive to 1,500 to 2,000 meters. When they go out to sea, they almost continually dive to that depth. They can dive, make dives as long as two hours down to those depths. And then they're incredibly large. The big males, as I say, are sort of up to sort of 4,000 plus kilos. So just enormous, enormous big animals. But um, as I said, it's that sort of big, deep diving ability and being able to go you know, all around the sub-Antarctic that makes them um, really interesting sort of the first big application that people don't really think of when they think of seals. And um, what it is about seals is that this is a track from Kerguelen in the sub-Antarctic. And these are all individual seals in the top left plot traveling down to the Antarctic shelf there. And that's the ice, that white coming back towards them. And that's basically like from Kerguelen to that ice sheet is about going from London to Morocco. So it's an incredibly long journey. And then they're making those dives. And those color changes are a couple of different things from an animal born instrument there. Um, on this is Rudolph the seal on his head. You see, this is temperature and salinity. Um, and this is very, very important um, oceanographic data. So above 71 degrees north and 71 degrees south, so those polar, those true polar ecosystems, 90% of all of the oceanographic traces that come from there all come from seals, all come from these little instruments on um, Rudolph's head here. These are from the Sea Mammal Research Unit. They're called conductivity time depth recorders. And then they log the data and then they transmit that data via Argos. So all, you know, a significant, a really significant proportion of our understanding of what is happening in terms of climate change and how that's affecting the Arctic ecosystems, that data all comes from seals. So they're actually very important in feeding back to us in terms of how we're affecting you know, the climate in these really important regions. And actually within the UK, the Met Office funds um, has funded a number of deployments on grey seals around the UK with these same instruments that are feeding data back continuously to the Met Office to help with weather predictions. So the sort of diving behavior sort of is feeding right back into, you know, the, the weather you get on your, your on your phone, but also, as I say, understanding our impacts of climate change. So seals are actually very beneficial to us in a way you might not necessarily think. But for me, it's really the physiology that's, that's truly interesting because these animals just have the most extreme physiology and most extreme physiological adaptations that I sort of want to sort of explain now. And that's going to be the sort of crux of the talk and this sort of use of biomedical optics to improve our understanding of physiology. So this first plot, this is some data, heart rate data from uh, actually from a grey seal collected back in the 90s up around the coast of Scotland. So this is our heart rate here on the on the y axis and then a time trace here on the a part of a time trace here on the x axis. And what's interesting about this dive, this is the sort of most extreme dive, is that the seal's heart rate goes from fairly high at the surface, you know, just below 120 beats a minute, and then it drops like a stone down to, in this case, four beats a minute, you know, in the case of a few seconds and a few beats. So that's an extreme, almost a catastrophic change in the heart rate. I think if that happened to one of us, you'd hit the floor pretty quickly and they'd be calling for the defib. But what's really important about this is that the heart rate drops, and then it stays low. It stays low throughout the dive, and then it comes back up again at the end of the dive. So it doesn't sort of modulate with the dive, with the depth of time. It just drops, stays there, and then it comes back up again. And if we look at this heart rate data along with dive duration, so this is our heart rate again on the y-axis, and then dive duration on the x-axis. And I really want you just to focus on this bottom plot here. All you can see is that initial drop in heart rate, that basically that diving heart rate, how low the animal basically decides to make that. So those are totally free ranging animals diving out off the west coast of Scotland with a, a little sort of EKG transponder that turned the signal into a radio um, signal that transmitted that to a boat that was sort of miles off following them and then basically logged the sound. So basically the seals decide how long they want to dive and they make a physiological sort of configuration that matches the anticipated challenge of that dive. And then that's something incredibly sophisticated to do. And basically in doing that, they're actually helping to regulate 
dine regulate the amount of oxygen they consume per unit of time to match the anticipated challenge of the dive. So it's a very sophisticated sort of cognitive physiological matching, which makes seals to me incredibly interesting. But they're not the only animals that doing it do it. And a few years ago, Siri Almagard from Aarhus University in Denmark, the really elegant study on porpoise, where she basically showed the same thing, but in captivity, is that if we look at, again, this is X, uh, time on the x-axis and heart rate on the y-axis, these sort of two color bands, blue and yellow and white, are two different dive durations. So the animal is being asked to dive for, you know, a 15 sort of second dive and then a slightly longer dive, about a 80 second dive. And basically what they find is that once the animal learns how long it's being asked to dive for, it modulates heart rate again, appropriate to how long it expects to dive for. But it's not just the sort of this control of how, you know, modulating heart rate and obviously the associated cardiovascular changes associated with changes in heart rate that they're modulating. They're actually modulating when that happens. So for us, if we put our face in water, we get this dive response, you know, just like birds do and just like um, pigs would do and like seals do. But the seals actually have taken it so far forward in terms of um, hijacking the system for their control. That they don't actually even need any stimulation. This is an, an old plot from the 70s. This is again heart rate on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And basically this dotted line here is the onset of the dive. And what they repeatedly found were that the seals actually drop heart rate without any physical stimulation which would require for us to go into the dive response. These animals, the seals again, can just they've completely hijacked the system to get control over it. And even one step further than that, this is again on the x-axis, but this is brain temperature on the y-axis. This is some older data from the Norwegians that's sort of quite invasive, and I sort of want to get to that topic um, again, sort of quite briefly, or, or just in, in a few slides. But basically what they find is that seals can drop brain temperature during a dive, and they actually find in some cases that animals could drop brain temperature in anticipation of diving. So if we take the sort of changes in the heart rate to match how long the animal expects to dive, the ability to drop heart rate before there's physical stimulation, basically putting your face in water, and actually able to modulate um, brain temperature. It also sort of gets to this point that the animals have a very, very sophisticated control. And there seems to be at least some cognitive influence on that physiological ability. And basically that physiological control is allowing the animals to modulate essentially metabolic rate and inhibit these metabolic retreats and modulate those. But what's very key to me is that the animals do this, right? They do this in the wild and to really understand that you have to be able to capture sort of essentially the seal story you know we want to kind of get more sophisticated with how we collect data and despite all those sort of physiological physiological changes and down regulating metabolic rate and conserving oxygen the, the the elephant seals anyway are just so extreme that this is a an indwelling um, arterial um, PO2 sample. So this is basically a Clark electrode in elephant seals in the US where they go into the brachial vein to get PO2. And so obviously quite an invasive way of getting oxygen. And again, it's something I'll come back to and sort of where we're focused. But basically that at the end of what is a fairly regular dive, this animal's arterial PO2, brachial artery PO2, is at three millimeters of mercury. It should be plus 80. Ours, you know, is 80 plus. This animal's basically as close to, I think, as you can get to clinically dead, right? Um, in terms of arterial oxygenation. So these animals are just so incredibly extreme. And as I said, it's this ability for the animals to do things in the wild, to modulate it, that we want to be able to get to. We want to kind of get away from this sort of old work where this is the old Strolander work. He was really one of the one of the best, most renowned physiologists, uh, an exceptional researcher that contributed a significant amount. But now I think the methods would be justifiably viewed as archaic where essentially this is a seal in there in that sort of like tub and then you basically put the seal underwater without access to uh, air and basically see what the physiological responses were so obviously quite grim work and you know that builds upon other sort of grim work you know like um connecting the arteries and veins the carotid and jugular veins of two different dogs and stopping one breathing to see what happens in terms of chemoreception stimulation, the other dog, and even things like training um, hares to smoke cigarettes. So basically, there's this whole world of, um, you know, very informative 
data collection, understanding of physiology, but really in the modern day, I think we have a duty of responsibility to do things better. Okay, at least when I say better, I don't mean to do the science better, but I mean to try and do things in a, a more in less invasive way to really make it minimally invasive. And to do that, the sort of key pathway is really collaborative science outside of biology with, with, with STEM, right? With um, technology, with engineering, with chemists, with physicists. And um, the limitation always has been, um, you know, what technology exists. And for us, this is where we started to think about this um, technology called near infrared spectroscopy, which I think certainly some IR spectroscopy, some of you will be familiar with. And for me, my sort of introduction into this actually came through UCL. Um, it was at a conference where Professor Claire Elwell of the, the physics department um, gave a fantastic talk and really opened my eyes to the capabilities of, of NEARS. And indeed, UCL has an absolutely spectacular um, biomedical optics department with, with Claire Elwell and Ilias Tashidis um, and uh, people like Rob Cooper. So you really do have a, a really wonderful group down there and Gower Labs. So that initial conversation with Claire Elwell basically sent me off in this direction of NEARS. So now I want to sort of give you a little journey through how we use NEARS in these interesting animals to what, do things we hope more ethically and um, to remove the need to break the skin and, and implant stuff and to kind of do things the way they do it in you know those tracks where we instrument an animal, it goes off and does its thing, its thing and we learn that way remotely rather than bringing animals into captivity or yeah doing some of the more invasive work. Um, in terms of what NEARS is, this is an incredibly, incredibly um, sort of simplistic overview of NEARS and the, the modality that I'm interested in using is continuous way of NEARS because of its relative cost and size and um, the fact that it is wearable. Um, basically, we emit we have two wavelengths of light from three places in the head with the system we use. And that light then takes a sort of path through the tissue. Um, a certain fraction of that light then exits the head where it's detected. And based on the intensity changes of that light, as well as understanding of some of the, the optical properties of the underlying tissue, like the, the skull, the skull and the brain, which we do with other modalities of NEARS, like frequency domain and time domain NEARS, we can basically extract a couple of relative metrics. We can get relative changes in oxyhemoglobin and we can get relative changes in deoxyhemoglobin. So does this seem like a sort of no-brainer to sort of pick up and try to, you know, test, efficacy test? And that's really what we did back in 2017. Um, our sort of big questions were is like, come on, can we make this waterproof? Can we make it pressure-proof? Can we make a seal-proof? Because seals are not delicate animals when it comes to um, expensive equipment. And can we find a way to attach it to a seal? So we use these wonderful little animals. This is a, a juvenile harbour seal. This is the prettier one that comes from the Pacific, but we have them around the UK as well, and it's just quite as handsome. And um, basically, this is our first really ugly prototype of the instrument on a juvenile elephant seal in California. And you see, we have this section here, which contains the sensor body and the, the battery and the sort of circuitry and the memory connected to a sort of small sensor head that we put atop of the, the seal's head. Um, just in, you know, much like you do with a smartwatch, right? Just in contact with the skin. And then we use the animal's fur, like we do our other instrumentation to sort of bond this white frame down to give us an anchor point. Um, so we did this in our short-term captive animal facility at the Sea Mammal Research Unit, where we go out, we bring animals in for, for a number of months, and then we release them again back where we caught them. And where we can, we instrument them to see, make sure that they integrate back into sort of seal society. Um, after a short term in captivity. And um, when we say we do experiments, basically what that means is we have an animal here that's in a, a respiratory chamber, which they feel very comfortable in because they're historically ice breeding animals. And actually you can get very close to them when they're in a breathing chamber. And then from there, they have to swim underwater to a feeder where they get fish and then they swim back. And basically what they do when they're in there is completely up to them. They just dive out of their own volition. And basically what we want to do is see, can we get anything from the nears whatsoever? So the two metrics we got the first time around were um, relative blood volume changes in the brain, which is going to be up here in the, the brain on the top right, and then um, changes in blood oxygen saturation in the brain, which is down here in the bottom right. So basically the changes you're going to see here, sort of green is almost sort of um, baseline starting. If either of those colors move to red, there's more 
blood or oxygen in the brain. And if it moves down towards blue, there's less. So what you're going to see visualized here is coming from this animal at that moment in time. And what we find is actually a bit like the heart rate stuff was before the animal dives. What we've seen was if we look at the blood volume here, is that we start to see this change in blood volume right before the animal dive, or basically we get all this blood going into the brain right before they dive without any stimulation. And then we see the animal dive, things would start to balance out a little bit, sort of swims around the pool. And then just as it gets to the feeder, if you look at oxygen, we've seen this sort of surprising change that the animal now, at this point in time, actually has a higher blood oxygen saturation in the brain than it did before it was diving. But bear in mind, this is about four, five, six dives into a, a series of dives. But bizarrely, we start to see that animals actually end up with higher oxygenation below the water than they do at the surface. And it's a question we haven't quite cracked the nut of yet, but we have a couple of ideas as to what's causing that. So um, the sort of big take home from that, for us anyway, was that yeah, much like the heart rate, we were saying that seals were controlling this change in perfusion. So what they do when they die was basically they get all the blood away from the, the periphery, sort of the muscle, the skin and the fat towards the core and deliver it all to the brain. And what we were saying is that's actually happening um, before the animals would dive, as well as these interesting underwater dynamics. So for us, it was sort of a big sort of revelation that, that this tool works. We get something from it. We get this nice repeated pattern between animals, you know, across dives, repeated dives, and across sort of different days, the animal would dive. So we knew we were sort of onto something interesting. And then from there, we actually went to humans because they're much easier to work on. You can ask them to put something on. You can talk to them. They don't usually bite. They're kind of um, quite convenient for us as sort of ecologists to work on. So we made a, a Gen 2 of the system. Um, we took that out to the Freediving World Championships in, uh, in France back in 2019. And we instrumented, you know, sort of three of the top five sort of elite um, divers, really the, the world-class divers like this individual here, Alexei Malkinov, who just again broke his own record about a month or two ago when did a took a free dive down to 131 meters. So it was just wonderful to get to sort of instrument these guys. Um, and then because we have sort of redesigned the instrument, this wonderful work from an engineer in, in SMU called Steve Balfour, we really improved our data quality. Um, and as a result of that, we were able to sort of take the data to some professionals to Jana Kainerstorfer's lab at Carnegie Mellon University in the US and with her postdoc, Alex Roish. They really sort of, informed us of all of these other physiological metrics, not just brain oxygen saturation and um, blood volume changes, all these other data that we could get. So I'm just going to use this one dive from a diver to sort of explain the sort of suite of physiological data that we're now extracting from NEARS that are incredibly informative to us, using a human as a platform to understand how to develop the tool and the physiology before we're going back to apply it to animals. So um, this is a seven minute time series. This first two minutes here, this is pre-diving. And then this gray section here, this is a three, uh, three minute, 18 second dive where the diver in black here goes down to 94 meters on a breath hold before coming back up again. And this dive is sort of using hand over hand to pull themselves down a rope and back up a rope. And then the last two minutes is just this recovery phase after the dive. So one of the key things that we, we now pick out is, is heart rate, which is really informative for us as um, ecophysiologists. And here the diver's heart rate's nice and high before the dive jumps to sort of peak just as they go into the water. Um, descends sort of through, the heart rate drops through the descent phase to a minimum here of 24 beats a minute, but the lowest heart rate we got was 11 beats a minute. And then there's a little bit of an incline through ascent and then a big jump up to the recovery heart rate, you know, sort of post-exercise heart rate as you would expect. And then based on our ability to um, detect heart rate in the signals, we do some frequency analysis and fast food or transform the data. We get this nice spectral representation of heart rate. And then using that, we can extract an estimate of um, arterial blood oxygen saturation, SpO2 here. Um, and that gives us an idea of arterial delivery. So, you know, what I showed you with the elephant seal, where they get well, really a direct measure of PO2 by putting a, a catheter down into the brachial artery. We're getting 
saturation, which is different than PO2, but still incredibly informative, you know, just from sort of firing a few lights in contact with the animal's head. So it's, you know, a big deal for us. So some of the other interesting data we got, so we can now link this arterial delivery with brain saturation changes. Um, so we see before the dive, saturation is nice and high, 65 to sort of 75% where it should be. And then we see this big drop just at, you know, at before the diver dives. And what that is, is they use this um, breathing technique called lung packing, a lung packing maneuver or glossopharyngeal GM pumping, where basically they'll fill the lungs to sort of, you know, as much as they can, which in those guys is about eight liters. And then they basically use this technique, buccal pumping to sort of force about another two liters into the lungs. And during this, we used to see this big drop in TSI. It stays fairly constant during the dive. And then the sort of second half of the dive, these square boxes here, these are involuntary breathing movements. So that's basically where the diver reaches a, a physiological break point. And basically you start to get these diaphragm contractions where the body's basically trying to pull air in. And then we get to the end of the dive and then we see this sort of rapid drop, which actually sort of driven by something very similar to what we see in the seals when they're underwater and still something we haven't really got to the bottom of. But if we take the heart rate data, this is sort of what I find very interesting. This is our deepest dive. So this is the, the depth trace in blue here. And our diver goes down to 110 meters on a breath hold, this, this time with bifins just swimming down. Um, 110 meters and then back up over about a four minute and 10 second dive. And this is um, that diver's heart rate trace in black. So the similar pattern drops down through descent to a minimum at the bottom of the dive before a gradual increase back up before hitting the surface. If we take dive data from a California sea lion, so this is not the seal, these, these nice don't have this sort of nice drop in heart rate that stays low and comes up. Um, they're sort of a different animal, again, evolved from the bear. So if we look at a dive trace from them, so much deeper, 240 meters, but about the same time, this was four minutes and um, 20 second dive. And if we take the heart rate from the sea lion, it's actually quite amazing to me anyway, how similar both in the dynamics of change and the magnitude of change, other than really this last little phase here where the heart rate comes up in the sea lion, how similar that the, um, the physiology of the, the cardiovascular changes are in the sea lion compared to the human, which is sort of interesting in a comparative context in terms of if we do want to learn from the animals in terms of how they deal with the physiological assault, they're not evolutionarily to some extent that different than us, right? They have a set of lungs, they have a heart, and they're going through the same sort of changes as the humans are when they dive. So to take things a step further, the other kind of metrics that we're getting from the data, and this is kind of getting really into the nitty gritty, but for us, to me anyway, is amazing, which you can get from a couple of wavelengths of light. This is some heart rate data, the cardiac waveform, as we call it, from um, a diver, and this is from a seal. So this red line here, this is sort of the normal enough looking cardiac waveform, where you get the ejection of heart from the blood, and systole, you get this peak, and then you get this decline, down to the start of the next heartbeat. And what we find is that as heart rate gets lower, so basically as these lines get lighter in color towards the sort of light yellow and become wider on the x-axis, that's a lower heart rate. What we find is that this peak, this sort of systolic peak jumps up. So it goes from two micromole here to three micromole. And what that we think is a sort of a measure of likely an increase in arterial pressure, which we know happens in free divers. Um, you get actually quite phenomenal increases in sort of systolic pressure of about 240, 260, really high, at least in sort of shallow dives and, and, and hyperbaric treatment. So we think that's what's occurring here. But secondary to that, we get this other phenomenon. So whereas we get this first peak and then a drop, at those lower heart rates, we get a peak, and then we get a second peak. This is called a tidal peak. And this actually, in some cases, becomes higher than the sort of first peak that we would expect to be the highest. And we think that's giving us some information Hard to tell with this modality of NEARS, we will want to validate it with something called um, diffuse correlation spectroscopy, um, is that it's given us information on the local pressure environment. So we think this is actually secondary to the increase in blood pressure. Arterial pressure is an increase in intracranial pressure, oh, sorry, which is obviously not something that you want to happen. Um, and again, actually, we were surprised that we actually see this on our seal data as well, as we get this nice sort of quick up and down in the seal. This blood sort of certainly here anyway wants to get below about 40 beats a minute. We see this sort of spike in the, the height. And we also see this development of a secondary peak. 
So again, the, the data is just, the, the instrument is just providing us with so much information from two wavelengths of light that to us anyway, are completely fascinating, just stuff we, we don't ever really see anything occurring at the level of the brain in an animal, unless you want to be incredibly invasive, which, you know, I just, I don't, I, I don't sort of see the reward in it. And then we can sort of link, you know, those changes in the waveform. So this is just standardized, not, you know, for duration of the heart rate and um, height. So to look at, is it depth that causes it or is it, you know, actually changes in heart rate that, that cause it? So beyond the sort of sales stuff and human stuff, we've now moved into these sort of, well, what are sort of a lot of people's sort of favorite marine mammal, that the sort of small cetaceans like that, the dolphins on the left and the, the porpoise. And I was just sort of collecting some data between about five and 545 there on some dolphins. And um, they're a significantly different challenge in terms of their an anatomy. They, seals don't really have, especially on the head, they've got a very, very thin skull, maybe a couple of millimeters. The distance from the skin to the skull is, five, six millimeters. Dolphin, however, you're talking about six centimeters of blubber to the skull and then quite a thick skull. So they're just a different challenge. But working away from the brain, if we're just looking at the skin and the blubber, we still get a lot of interesting information. Cetaceans are, don't have the same sort of provenance in diving physiology as, as um, sorry, dolphins don't have the same physiology provenance and physiology of seals um, because they're quite hard to catch. They don't necessarily do so well if they don't have a good pool and proper treatment where seals are quite robust because there's terrestrial phase. So anything that we can get from dolphins in terms of physiology is enormous and nears is we think one of those tools. So basically we at the minute we have um, the sensor head that was on the head of the seal in a suction cup. So it's just basically like, you know, like a little thing for lifting uh, lifting glass, just pop it on and it just stays on there for a little bit. And that's giving us this nice data. So this is our nearest data here. So these are the, the cardiac oscillations, just like in the last plot from the seal and the diver. And we've lined these up with simultaneous measurements of EKG. So it's our EKG signal and that's our heart rate from the EKG. And we're getting this nice pattern between you know, EKG gold standard measurement and what we're getting in the nears. So we're actually seeing, we're measuring true physiology. And then the fact that it's working on dolphin, the seal and the human sort of starts to give us options to do some comparative physiology, which is quite nice. This is just a little snippet I put together looking at the impact of respiration, something, you know, we all sort of take for granted. But in a marine mammal, it's a very interesting phenomena because of the impact changes in intrathoracic pressure have on this whole suite of physiological metrics. And to us, we just think a seal breathes, it dives, it doesn't breathe, and then once it the surface, it breathes, equally a dolphin. But what we're actually seeing is what we call cardio, um, cardio respiratory matching. So we see what happens in the heart when the lungs change. It's actually very, very different. These animals have very different breathing mechanics. So this top plot here, this red, this is our oxyhemoglobin, and our blues are deoxy. And these sort of higher frequency oscillations, that's our heart rate in the human. And then these lower wave oscillations are what we see in breathing, the sort of inspiration and expiration. And we see these sort of little peaks in heart rate during inhalation and then little drops during exhalation, something called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. If we look at the seal, we have two respiration events here. So this is one respiratory cycle in the human. And then in the seal, we have our first respiration event at about five seconds here. And breathing in a seal is very different. It's almost like um, in, in medicine, a Valsalva maneuver where they go, so seal dive on an exhalation, breathe in and then dive. But when they're at the surface breathing, it's the opposite. They'll breathe, they'll hold their breath in and then they'll go, and then they'll squeeze the chest. And basically that dynamic is completely different. So what we see is when they inhale, squeeze the chest we get this big drop in heart rate we get this bradycardia so we get this increase in what looks like blood pressure the wave moves up increase in pulse pressure and then we get this sort of increase in heart rate in between the breaths and then another respiratory event with the same pattern so basically after they breathe we get a drop in heart rate and then an increase in heart rate which is the opposite actually to the dolphin so the dolphin's inhaling here at um, zero seconds and then in black here, our heart rate, we get an increase in heart rate, showing which we know a respiratory sinus arrhythmia in the dolphin. And then another sort of lack of sort of inhalation. And then a second respiratory event, we get the same pattern, the sinus arrhythmia. So even on a very basic level, NEARS is providing us with just such a wealth of data, non-invasively, which is just sort of really phenomenal for us. Um, you know, we can look at how an inhalation and an exhalation affect things like blood, 
blood pressure, retentive intracranial pressure, arterial blood oxygen saturation, um, brain oxygen saturation, um, the heart rate, um, blood volume changes. So this wealth of data from two flickering lights, which to us as ecophysiologists or ecologists, it's just phenomenal, even though it's being used in physics and biomedicine for a long time. And so as what's happening now, we have an instrument that's on its way at the minute from La Reunion Island to Kerguelen, uh, where it's going to go down to this colony here in, um, in Kerguelen to go on some of these nice rotund elephant seals in the next few, um, hopefully it'll arrive in about three weeks time and we'll start making measurements. Beyond that, we're actually sort of going more into the human stuff because we find it incredibly fascinating and we want to learn as much as we can about humans and, and interpreting NIRS data. Because when you hold your breath and you dive and you come back up, physiologically, it's an incredibly dynamic and complex um, physiological environment for us to interpret. So we need to learn more from the humans. And that work's been sort of led by myself in collaboration with Joanna Kershaw from Plymouth University. It was Joe that was bitten by the seal, so she'd be pleased to be working on humans and not get bitten. Yannick Kennestorfer, who's going to be using some diffuse correlation spectroscopy to help us with the sort of effect of blood flow and intracranial pressure on our data. And Gemma Beale, um, who's actually was in um, UCL until last year, and she's now got a lectureship at Cambridge University, who's going to be using some of the, the wonderful technology that I really pioneered and, and mastered by um, UCL, by Ilias Tashida's lab, this hyperspectral NIRS or broadband NIRS. We're going to be using that to look at cerebral metabolic rate in the divers and then hopefully starting to translate some of this to the humans. And the nice thing about that is, I say, humans are nice and controlled, but we can also do more things with humans. We can do better validation. You know, we can get blood at depth. Um, we can actually have doctors on scuba with the divers to do you know, measurements of blood flow in place with um, an aquatic um, ultrasound Doppler. So it's basically we're trying to learn as much as we can from humans to sort of pull back into the marine environment. Then we're also, um, now that we've had success with NIRS, we're actually integrating NIRS. As I said at the beginning, you know, we need the animals to tell us their story. And to do that, the big limitation has been power and an ability to get this out to sea and then get data back. So what we're doing is we're now using a Gen 2 near system. So where we could work for a couple of hours data and collect a couple of hours of data, sort of 50 hertz where we want to be. And we can now collect for about five to seven days continuously, which is enormous for us. So we're now integrating the, the near system into these GPS GSM phone tags, which don't look like this anymore. Um, this is on a, a harbor sail. They actually look like this, they're nice and streamlined now. So basically we'll have our circuit board in here and then a fly wire to that sensor head. So then that's going to allow us to collect nearest data along with location data, dive depth, triaxial accelerometry, fluorimetry, which gives us an idea about um, plankton in the phytoplankton in the water, sound. So we can actually measure what the sound environment is like because we have concerns about the impact of offshore renewables, um, installation and their function, um, temperature, salinity. And then the most important thing is we need to start breaking those nearest data down into little sort of like snippets that's useful. So heart rate at the start, the bottom and the end of a dive and oxygenation at the start and end of a dive and actually start transmitting those data. And the whole purpose of that is because, you know, we are quite clearly in a, a, an unideal an place in terms of the impacts of fossil fuels and demand for fossil fuels. And there's a movement towards renewable energy for which the sea is a very good resource. It's, it's much more predictable, especially if we're thinking about things like tidal energy. And this is a great trace here from one of our um, colleagues, um, Debbie Russell, Dr. Debbie Russell and Smru. Each of these sort of little focal points here, that's the, the base of uh, an at sea wind turbine. Right, so that's basically it at the seabed. And this trace here is trace data from a sail. So basically what we see are sails that encounter these sort of off, offshore um, structures, actually use them almost like a little map and target around. What we think is that they basically form little aggregations of prey that the sails can then utilize. But basically what we want to use NEARS for is a physiological tool to start to understand how offshore renewable installations, the behavioral change, avoidance, you know, sound is affecting the physiology of the animal. And the only way to do that is really non-invasively with a small instrument like NEARS integrated into the tools that we already use. So very briefly, just to kind of wrap up, one additional application we use NEARS for is actually brain imaging, and we've at least tried it anyway. And basically, 
to do brain imaging with NEARS, um, we sort of rely on something called a hemodynamic epiphenomenon. And basically what happens is if you're a sort of basal state, if you have, you know, activate the say region here in red, it's metabolically active. We see this hemodynamic phenomenon where basically there's an increase in blood delivery, which increases local um, oxygenation. And because we can measure oxygenation and blood volume with the NEARS, we can basically if we put lots of these on, we can actually find out which parts of the brain are active in the same. So basically it looks a little bit more something like this, where we're sort of covering the head and we've only done, this will only ever be done in sort of captive and sort of structured environments. And um, so we basically tried this in sales. We had to find out how, what stimuli do you deliver to a sale? What way do you deliver the stimuli? How do you attach it? You know, all the same problems and find a way, to, you know, to estimate what part of the brain we're looking at. So we use these wonderful animals. Um, these are juvenile gray seals that we also have in Scotland that you probably maybe see some videos of of people in the Farne Islands underwater being close up close to them. They're just like sea dogs. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, so we use these to test if we can actually use NEARS to measure brain activity because when it comes to free ranging animals, we don't truly understand how they sense their environment, what senses they rely upon, and therefore how things like climate change, anthropogenic activity, disturbance might actually affect their ability to sense the environment. So taking this rig, basically we had to first start out with a 3D print of a seal. So we use some photogrammetry to get a 3D model of a seal. And then we sort of design an array, which basically looks like this, where we have our emitters and our receivers designed to sort of cover as much of the brain as possible. And then we wanted to make it nice and simple. So as this sort of beautiful Australian sea lion illustrates, it's very easy to spot what the senses are. They've got ears, so they're very, very acute hearing. Uh, almost all marine mammals do. Seals, sea lions anyway, have particularly acute eyesight. Not all marine mammals do. Uh, for instance, something like a bodo river dolphin that lives in the um, in sort of rivers certainly don't. And then this wonderful vibrissal assemblage, which is sort of really key to how they sense their environment. It's sort of the turbid in the dark, turbid environments in the dark. So we see we decided visual stimuli, let's stimulate the eyes, let's do some tactile stimulation, stimulate the whiskers, and let's play some sounds to them and, and stimulate the sort of um, auditory cortex. And what we find and using those data not just for sort of systemic oh. physiological measurement, because we can. So what happens when you record a talk for a conference and forget to delete the um the uh, the sound? So actually, this is the most interesting plot. So this on the left side, this is where we stimulate the right whisker, and on the right, that's where we stimulate the the left whisker. And what we see is basically we get this nice contralateral stimulation. So we stimulate the left whiskers. We see this little part of the brain here firing, which we think from old quite invasive EEG work is the somatosensory cortex in the seal. And then on the, the right here, we sort of see, if we stimulate the other side, we get the nice other sort of side of the, the brain being active. And then if we look at some auditory stimulation, we sort of get a little bit more of a complex picture. And um, this was sort of not quite as clear as the, the vibrissal stimulation. But if we play sounds, we get this sort of region here in the back of the brain. We think this actually back here was sort of overlap with visual stimuli and we think that's because when we play the sound this is basically trying to look at where the sound is coming from it so sort of busy trying to identify where the sound is as well as the sort of forward auditory cortex so that's really it in terms of my work um in terms of future research we've got lots of ideas but i kind of wanted to use this as a little bit of a, a pledge to to you guys um we as ecologists are quite good at adapting things and, and utilizing in them but what we don't have is the sort of expertise that you guys have, the familiarity with technology, you know, existing technology or sort of horizon technology. And that's where I think the sort of first overlap really with biomedical and physics has been incredibly rewarding. We really need people from your background to sort of come to us as well and tell us what do you find interesting? What would you like to know? What technologies do you have? Because we just, I think science isn't really always set up for us to liaise with you know, chemistry to the, the level you do and understand. And you're just a sort of like Miranda, um, who was, you know, president last year, is now doing marine mammal work and uh, the master's in St. Andrews. Um, it's wonderful to have that bridge. And my sort of pledge to you is if you do have ideas, things that you think would be interesting, just because you're a chemist, that doesn't mean you can't come and work on these sort of charismatic animals here that I decided to fill the, the page with. You absolutely can. And it could be incredibly rewarding for us but also for understanding the animals. So if you do 
have ideas or want to suggest technologies, we're all ears. We really are. In the ears, we didn't really, people laughed at me when I thought, well, we'll try this and it's been fairly successful. So please, I'm sure there's just millions of millions of ideas that you guys have. So please, please do come to us. You know, it's just me as a sort of initial gateway. Please do come to us and tell us what you think your tools could do and your research could do because we can get blood, poo, urine, vomit, blood, fur, skin, everything, right? We can get all of these things that are interesting as well as putting instruments on animals and how animals sort of do things for us. So please do sort of let us know. So with that, I want to thank you all really for listening to this sort of off topic talk um, and thanks to all these sort of folks that have contributed. And if there is time for questions, I'm certainly happy to take them. And then just sort of in the background, I'm just gonna let this little video play in case people are really interested in questions but want to hang around. This is a little video of um, one of our deepest dive from the free divers and just some of the physiological data from that diver on this dive. So thank you very much. I'm happy to questions. You don't have to watch the video. I'm just going to put it on. <laughs> okay. Don't thank listen. you so much. That was so interesting to see how how the technology can combine and the seals are so cute. I'm I think I'm in the wrong <laughs> in the wrong field here. <laughs> Yeah, definitely can open the floor to questions if you'd like to type them in the chat or to put your hand up. Um, Hannah, was that a hand up from you? Oh, I have a question. I'll ask the first question while people have a think. Um, you mentioned that you had an idea of why the blood oxygenation was higher underwater than above water. What would that be? So what we see at the end of the, the human divers, just as we see in the seals at the beginning of a dive, is what we think is basically a limitation in venous outflow from the brain. So basically what goes in, if it's matched in the wired, of course, then you'll have sort of equilibrium and volume. What we think is happening, um, not always easy to tell with the sort of nearest data because it is very conflated, is that we think we're seeing an increase in the venous contribution in the brain. So if we're imagining blood goes in this way and out this way, um, into the artery, through the capillary bed and out, what we're seeing is a, a much greater contribution in, in, in the venous sort of dimension of that sort of arterial venous mix. And what we think that's a result of is a change in, in an increase in venous pressure either an increase in venous pressure or a decrease in venous pressure so much so that we see some, some collapse and basically the intrathoracic entry of the vessels back into the thorax. But basically something's limiting blood. We can replicate it on ourselves either with a sort of slight sort of jugular occlusion or say for an, a sort of venous occlusion on the arm. So we see it in the diver at the end of the dive. We've been doing some work in Italy and much more controlled in that deep joy facility. And we see it in divers there, but we see it in the sail busy just before they dive. There seems to be some venous backlog. And basically by the time they dive, get round, we see that venous drainage clear. And then all of a sudden, basically that contribution in the arterial contribution goes up. So there's probably always good arterial delivery. We're just seeing this backlog in venous. So it might well be that although this sort of mix looks like there's low oxygen in the brain, when it comes to arterial oxygen and delivery, it's probably fine. It's just a sort of conflated measure. So we'd probably in April next year do some venous pressure profiles on elephant seals when they're doing these sleep apneas. We basically sleep for 10 minutes and hold a breath and then wake up to see if we can see that it is a change in venous pressure that's causing it. But we don't know, but that's what we think. It could be something completely different. <laughs> It's really interesting. It's interesting. It's really cool how the pressure makes such a difference from all, yeah. all different areas. Yeah, and, and that's sort of the other thing is that we collect this sort of interesting human data and um, seal data, and then you sort of go to the sort of nearest professionals and then they will look like, I'm kind of stuck here for an explanation because we don't see this in humans, right? <laughs> because you've got these respiratory mechanics that are very different. You've also got these huge changes in atmospheric pressure, you know, like these you know that diver you know his lungs are you know probably about the size of a fist a little bit smaller than a fist by the time you know when he started at 10 liters by the time he's at the bottom of the dive so just have all of these different pressure dynamics affecting the body and um yeah pressure is sort of a massive influence on in all of all of the data we see and it's quite hard to then replicate that in a controlled way to say that's pressure or, you know, or that's just oxygenation. So it's quite a challenging environment. 
as best you will fully go with the signals. That's why we're trying to learn as much as we can from the humans. You know, the nice intermediary bridge between human technology and the water marine mammals. And they're quite fun. And they tend to dive places that's really warm and nice, not kind of rainy, windy Scotland. <laughs> nice change. That's been nice. Um, James has a question. Hi. Yeah, you said when you were doing the human traces of the um, oxygen saturation that you went straight to, you know, like some of the top five free divers in the world. Um, is there a reason you immediately went to the you know, top of the top of the diving world and um, presumably more effort to do so than rather than test on someone that was worse or perhaps yourselves? Yeah, totally. They were the first people to put their hands up, actually. Um, whenever we sort of made contact through uh, a sort of group of Swedes that work a lot, on the elite free divers, whenever we were going out to the championships and we suggested we had this tool that looks at the, you know, it looks at oxy and deoxyhemoglobin in the brain. As soon as you mentioned brain, they were the first guys to put their hands up actually. And, uh, you know, they were going for deep, deep, deep dives. So then it was the kind of sort of, yeah, I don't know, the kind of bit in me that was like, oh, that'll be really interesting if they go to really, really deep. And there's really only not a huge number of individuals that can do that. And then I was also quite keen that, um, so I say that that crew principle, um, pick the best biological model for the, the sort of question. I think like, if we're going to really see good changes here that sort of get people excited in the tool and funders excited in the tool, let's go to the guys that are going to give us the, the sort of the best data. But uh, yeah, no, I, there wasn't too much thought in it. It was really just that those guys put their hands up and it was quite hard to say no to sort of Alexa and William Truebridge and, yeah, they're just phenomenal divers, honestly. When you put a tool on them for the first time and they go down and it takes, it's a long four minute wait for them to come back up again because after 30 minutes, they're on their own, right? There's no scuba, there's nothing. So you do kind of get a bit stressed about having, putting something different on these sort of really high qualified, sort of quite superstitious athletes. So I'm glad we did it, but it was yeah, quite nerve wracking. Um, I want to know how to engage in this research. I think, um, so you could contact myself. Um, you can also look on, you know, for instance, our, our department, the Sea Mammal Research Unit, you can look on there. And if there are ideas that you have, um, and you can sort of see what researchers are interested in, you know, you can drop them an email. And I really mean it when we get an email from somebody from really you know, outside the discipline that has some ideas and technology, we're really excited to explore it. So if you can, you get, as I say, you can contact me or you can go and look for what sort of researchers in places like St. Andrews or, um, you know, in uh, she's in France or, you know, Australia or Duke university in the U S you can go and look at those researchers, see what they do and reach out with the sort of sort of formulated idea of what the tool does and what it could provide. I think that would that's that's how I kind of got into into NEARS. So you know, I went the other way and engaged with them and I find um it's yeah, usually this idea of doing something new is quite engaging to people. So that would sort of be my suggestion. Oh thank you. No problem. Thank you. We have a few questions in the chat if you're up for it. We've yeah, got a question from know. Sophia. She says, in your opinion, what are the advantages of using large mammals like seals to monitor the environmental impacts in the sea compared to using things like jellyfish or even robot jellyfish which can squeeze into smaller spaces and cover larger distances? The big thing is water. Um, you need to transmit data, to, for, certainly for real-time measurement, but also sort of recovery. Um, if you put something on, say, like a, uh, it's a challenging one, like a, a white shark, they dive off. You don't really know where they are unless you follow them, which is logistically expensive. But in terms of you're going up to somewhere like the Arctic, um, it can cost, you know, 100, 400,000 pound a day to charter a vessel. So basically, it's very hard to be there to get data. And the good thing about a marine mammal is, of course, they have to dive and they have to come back to the surface. And in doing so, it makes them repeatedly and readily accessible to transmit data either via satellite or via GSM. So it's really that nature of having to come back to the surface and then having to dive to explore the environment sort of three dimensionally and back up again to transmit data that sort of makes them really useful for this kind of um, oceanographic sampling. Now you definitely can use other mammals or sorry, other animals such as leatherback turtles or indeed yet yeah, sharks or even some larger deep diving fish. 
Um, it's just the rate at which you can get data back. And as I said, in the UK, the Met Office deployments on gray sales, they're continually pinging data back, which is helping for real time, you know, um, input into models for predicting the weather for tomorrow and the day after. So it's really just a data accessibility and transmission in the marine mammals or an air breathing animal. Um, it's just that much easier, but you certainly could do it, as I say, on, on other animals that don't necessarily have to come to the surface. She says, thank you, it's very cool. Thank you. We have a last question from Susan and she's wondering if you've, you have any data on the seals diving and feeding at the same time and if that changes anything? Um, not, not really in the, the nears. Um, we do, have, so when they were in the pool, they were from around a feeder and taking fish, but we didn't really see very much there. I think um, one was a data, the first time out was a data quality issue. We couldn't really look for fine scale changes, but it's certainly something that we're interested in and something we hope we'll get in the free ranging deployments because we can use both the, the pressure data that give us depth, the surface data and location, but also acceleration in the data to work out when the seeds are actually att actively trying to catch fish because they have to lunge the head out and then pull the head back quickly to sort of, sort of evacuate water from the mouth. So we get these good ideas of like prey capture attempts. So we're quite interested then to look at how that affects the mirror's data in terms of um, yeah, what's happening at the level of the brain or heart rate, or if we could to some level, you know, sort of quite crude um, cortical activation stuff. And I know there's some work um, by uh, Jesse Kendall Barr using e free on free ranging elephant sales using EEG data to look at sort of cortical activation. So something I'd really like to do, but we just haven't really got there quite yet. But hopefully in the next few years, we'll be there, I hope. But that's a very Thank good you. question, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Susan says thank you as well. If we don't have any more questions, we could go into breakout rooms to chat a bit more informally, get to know each other, catch up after the summer holidays. Chris, if you're interested in staying and chatting, you're very welcome to. We'd love to get to know you a bit better. I'm going to make breakout rooms. Oh, I should stop the recording. Let me do that.